Hi, I'm Michael Colley. Today I'm going to show you how to brew coffee with an immersion method. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to immerse yourself in your system. We've talked a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your system. And today we're going to begin to bring the two together. I'm Michael Colley, and I help you bring more of who you are to what you do. So last time I showed you how to make a French press, which is how I started brewing coffee after using a drip machine. And following the French press, I was hanging out at a coffee shop in Nashville called Crema, which is a great coffee shop we have in town, and they told me about an immersion method. And, uh, and so I picked up something similar to this. This was about 10 years ago, and I had a plastic version which ended up cracking over time. And so I got this ceramic version. And uh, basically what it is, is from my perspective, it's a combination of a French press with in the shape of a pour over. And so that's how I transitioned from making coffee with a French press, which is fairly straightforward, to making coffee with a pour over, which is a little more complicated. And in between, I used this uh, immersion method and so I'm going to show you how to do that. So what we'll do is with this immersion method uh, system, you will pick up a number four uh, coffee cone that you can get at your local grocery store. And just open these up. And then you just fold at the seams and that helps it seat a little better. And what I like to do is I like to actually dampen the filter a little bit as well. Dampen it. And water's gonna run out everywhere because I forgot to close the pot up. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news is that the filter is damp. So it's important to make sure this little lever right there is either open or closed. And before you get ready to start brewing the coffee in your immersion uh, coffee maker, you want to make sure it's switched to close. So you don't have what happened what I did earlier, which was dampen the filter with hot water and it all spilled out. So now that it is switched to closed, we're going to add our coffee beans in there. And I've already pre-ground the beans in this grinder and with the amount that I want. And so I'm just gonna dump them. Right on in. Put my piece of cork back in and close it and then just set it aside. And now what I like to do is just kind of shake the beans to even them out. And we're just going to take our hot water and pour it in. You don't have to pour um, in the way that I'm pouring right now, which is just kind of a sloppy pour over but I'm used to it from 
making pour overs and so I just go ahead and pour them this way. That's enough. So we're going to cover and we're going to let it steep just like we did with the French press for four minutes. Right, so we've had our timer go off and now it's time to put the coffee into our cup. Now, slide this to the open position. And I just always keep a hand on it because um, I have knocked it off before. Let's do a little check how it is. Nice. It's hard to bring who you are to what you do. I don't know about you, but my whole life, I've always been trying to accomplish something so that I would think that who I am is enough, so that I would impress others when I was 14 years old, my dad and I rode our bicycles from our house in Cleveland, Tennessee to Florida. Bicycles have been important to me for all, almost all of my life. Ever since I was six years old, uh, I had a great accomplishment on the bicycle at six. And in a big way, it informed who I am because it was the first accomplishment to win I connected who I am to an organization to make a difference. And I share more about that story in my book. Uh, and so they've always been important. I love bicycles. I love how beautiful they are. Uh, we have one in our office at home, uh, which you can see on the video here. And this is an old bicycle from the 70s. It's really cool. It's a PUCH, uh, P-U-C-H. It's a steel frame. Uh, there were some guys that were selling firewood just down the street from uh, where we live and they had this bike and and I saw it and uh, the frame looked beautiful um, something that was European and uh, and I asked them I said how much for the bike and they said oh how much do you want to give us I was like 20 bucks they said sure so I got it and didn't really know what it was and and brought it home and uh, began cleaning it up and and then took it to a powder coater and and uh, and then began doing some restoration on it. Now I have this beautiful um, three-speed fixie with an internal hub. Uh, it's fun to ride, um, but it's tough to ride and it's a little small for me. And so I just hang it in the office as art now. So bicycles have always been important to me because, um, you know, I think, and, and, and I think honestly, it's because as humans, we're trying to uh, make our mark, make an impact, define who we are. And for me in my life, I've tried to define who I am with accomplishment um, and with um, aesthetics uh, because I like, I like beautiful things. And um, in 2007, I was tired. It was January. I was on a leadership retreat and... For the first time in my life, I had a leader that I respected tell me that being is more important and comes before doing. I don't know that he said that being was more important than doing, but being comes before doing. And for me, that was a really significant learning because my whole life has been about doing accomplishing some athletic achievement when I was a teenager trying to be really good really fast at my career when I was getting started in my 20s 
And so five months later in May of 2007, I was taking my second class for my first doctorate, and it was a class on spirituality and leadership, and specifically on developing spiritual practices for leaders. And one of the people that came and gave a guest lecture owned a retreat center in Michigan near the university where I was studying. And at the end of the lecture, at the break, uh, I went and uh, introduced myself and asked if there was any availability that weekend uh, for a retreat. And she opened up a spot for me and I spent 30 hours in silence in a small cabin in the North Woods called Tikva. And Tikva is a Hebrew word which means hope. And during those 30 hours, I realized how empty I was spiritually as a leader. Because during those five months, even understanding that being comes before doing was just only the beginning of discovering my need for spiritual practice. And so I came back uh, to Texas um, where Ashley and my family and the team that we had gathered were planting a church for millennials. And we opened up a coffee shop and we named it Tikva, which means hope. And we opened it up as a place to teach people spiritual practice uh, through art and through meditation and reflection and prayer and for them to get a great cup of coffee and a sandwich, a great sandwich as well. At that time, a, a good dear friend of ours who passed away at the end of last year, her name was Nadine, and Nadine became the heart and soul of Tikva. She had had an opportunity in her life where she was looking for a place to give, and we needed someone who was willing to give, and so Nadine gave hours and hours of her time at Tikva creating it a place of warmth and comfort with great coffee and great food for the community. Uh, because being comfortable um, is necessary when we begin some type of spiritual practice. Now, as you study spirituality, and we're not going to get into it in depth in this episode, but as you study spirituality, you'll learn that there are desert times as well that are necessary. But getting started, you need some comfort because it's scary. I remember showing up for those 30 hours at the beginning of that retreat, and <clears throat> I wanted to go home. I didn't even want to get out of the car. I had a friend drop me, actually, and uh, but I, I went and I stayed and because... I don't know I don't know what it is but there's something about being human that makes us run away from our being to doing A couple years ago I was asked to teach a coaching course uh, at the university where I teach at uh, and uh, the theology school asked me to teach a uh, just a give a short lecture to Master of Divinity students. And I had transitioned from that time from my life and work as a, as a pastor into my life and work as a professor and an executive coach. And as part of the lecture, I was sharing my journey with these MDiv students. And I remember the students saying to me, man, you are really eclectic. And I never really thought about it until then. But I suppose I am. And I think being eclectic 
is a great way for us to begin to understand how to integrate our being with our doing. Because it takes some time to immerse and sit and bring those two together because we really have to reintroduce them again. One of my favorite books on leadership, On Becoming a Leader, by Warren Bennis. He says it like this. It's on page 106. No leader sets out to be a leader. People set out to live their lives, expressing themselves fully. When that expression is of value, they become leaders. So the point is not to become a leader. The point is to become yourself to use yourself completely, all your skills, gifts, and energies, in order to make your vision manifest. You must withhold nothing. You must in some become the person you started out to be and to enjoy the process of becoming. I hope you are enjoying the process of becoming. And I hope these videos are an aid on your journey to bringing who you are to what you do. I'm Michael Cauley. If you've liked this video, please click the like button and subscribe and leave a comment below. Thanks so much. I need the coffee today. I'm really tired.